Welcome guys to one more show of the Drum Department TV. Today I'm here at the site of the Drum Department with the one and only, the big, the great, Omar Hakim. <laughs> nice to have you here, sir. Thank, Thank you, you man. very much. Thank you, my pleasure. I can't, cannot really say how pleasured I am to have you here. Wow. Because you're one of the, of the legends of drumming. I mean, you're one of the most influential drummers I've ever listened to. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, my first question would be, you started at the age of five yeah. with drumming. Mm. Was there ever any doubt that you could become something else than a drummer? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yes. You know, because I started very young and because music was a very natural part of my house. Mm -hmm. My father was a professional musician. My mother wasn't a musician, but she loved music, so there was always records playing in my house. My uncle was a musician and loved music. You know, my aunt uh, was a pianist and a singer. There was always music with the family. So for me, music wasn't uh, something that was special necessarily. You know what I mean? It was just there. It was just there. <laughs> That's what we did. We played music. So, at about age 10, I started playing with my father's band as a professional mm -hmm. at 10 years old. And um, started playing gigs with him and meeting all the musicians in my neighborhood. I, with my father, I was playing jazz music and some pop music. But with my friends, mm -hmm. my age, we were playing more rock and R&B. Next generation. And <laughs> this sort of thing. But I say all of this to say that music was really just an everyday part of life. So when I got into high school, again, I went to a music high school, you know? <laughs> so I was like, okay, maybe... We can see the path. <laughs> yeah, we can see the path. It was, uh, it was already there for me. Mm -hmm. But I was getting ready to go to college. I see. And uh, I wasn't interested in going for music. I wanted, really? to, I wanted to either be in medicine, like a doctor or something like that, or mm -hmm. I was interested in science and aviation. Ah. So I was even thinking about uh, becoming a pilot or yes. something like that. Okay. It's because I figured I'm always doing music. <laughs> I want to do something else. I see, I see. But um, mm -hmm. right before I graduated high school, so many people were calling me to play drums. So I said to my mother and my father, I don't want to go to college for music. I want to go for something else. Mm. But before I go to college, mm -hmm. I want to take two years off from school. And what was the reaction? And just to play. Okay. Because, you know, up until that point, I was always dividing my time yeah. between school mm -hmm. and playing. And because so many people always calling, I was about 16, 17, 18 years old. Mm -hmm. I did my first tour when I was 15. Wow. So as you can see, you know, I, by the time I graduated from high school, I had already had a career in a way, you know what I mean, as a drummer. So I was like, okay, mom, dad, I'm gonna take a break from school. I'll play for two years and I'll do nothing but drums <laughs> because now I can rest and just concentrate. How was their reaction to that? They were okay. They were okay with it. They were fine. <laughs> and, and I said, I guess if nothing happens with the music mm -hmm. in two years, then I'll go back. But, then, but I'm not going to go for music. I'll go for something else. <laughs> they said, no problem. So anyway, wow. okay. I never made it back to school. <laughs> because as soon as I, I became free, the phone never stopped ringing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So many people calling and mm. uh, the touring. And from the time I was 15 mm -hmm. up until age 25 or 26 when I met Sting, I basically toured straight from oh. age 15 to 26. Wow. Never break. With not like every year I was doing yeah. something. Yeah. Even when I was in school. So, so music has been my life and my yeah. path and <laughs> really crazy story. Wow. So this is more like life pushed you in that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, in this way, you can say that there is some reality to the idea of destiny, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, that I when see. someone is wow. destined 
to do something, even if they don't think so. Yes. It still happens. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? It's a little bit the same with love. Yeah. Everybody around you seems to know it already that you are in love. And right. You and realize you, and and you're <laughs> the last person to realize. You're real, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. They can see it on your yeah, face. Or, exactly. So you perhaps know. everyone saw the musician in you. They did. <laughs> you know, and it's strange because I, for me, music was something that I do for fun and enjoyment. Mm -hmm. I never really set out to be the best drummer yeah. or you know, the fastest drummer or, mm. you know, I never thought about music that way. Music yeah. for me was always something that I did for fun and pleasure and and then I was always amazed because people give me money to play <laughs> drums. I'm like, that's pretty cool. I could actually do this as a job, you know? Yes. Wow. That's good. You getting know? money for something I like. <laughs> yeah, getting, exactly. Yeah. Getting paid for something you like. So. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're lucky, we are doing that. We mm -hmm. are, no matter what the job is, you know, whether oh. it's drumming or if you are a designer or architect mm -hmm. or whatever you do, you an actor. You have to love what you do. It's important to yes. love what you do, I yeah. think, you know, and believe in it. Yes, you in know? order to, keep, to get to yeah. keep with it. That's right, yeah. that's right. True. Um, you, didn't you get ever a glimpse before, before this decision, I'm going now for two years just for the musician, when you always met these famous drummers and musicians because your father had the connections and things like that? It's, again, it's when it's normal, you know, to a child, mm -hmm. you only know what your environment is, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And to you, that's normal. I see. You okay. follow? Yeah. So, I, it's only when I look back ah. that I go, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> I mean, we, we used to go to Art Blakey's house. Exactly. That's exactly. So people would give the little finger for get, going to Art Blakey's house. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember going to Art Blakey's house and there were drums everywhere. And <laughs> he would say, you know, do you want a snare drum or do you, you know, uh, you know, and, and my father was friends with John Coltrane. Mm -hmm. And we used to go to John Coltrane's house. Mm -hmm. And I remember to ring the doorbell. And John Coltrane answers the door with the saxophone around his <laughs> neck. And my mom said that every time he answered the door that I call him Big John. <laughs> Big John. I would always say that and, and make him laugh. So I didn't know that that was mm -hmm. legendary John Coltrane. Yeah. To me, he was Big John. Yeah, he was a nice man to me. Nice <laughs> man. And we'd go to the house and, wow. you know, we would see... Um, uh, McCoy Tyner, Elvin Jones, um, Rassan Roland Kirk. Uh, in our neighborhood, um, James Brown had a house there. Hmm. And Count Basie lived in this neighborhood. Oh my God, oh. So this neighborhood <laughs> was full of musicians. Yes. And when I was very young, I met Marcus Miller, mm -hmm. who's from the same neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And we became friends when we were like 14. Mm. And, and we, we also went, played together. We played together yes. uh, when we were young. Mm -hmm. um, so many musicians from this neighborhood. Mm. Unbelievable. Wow. Lenny White. Ah. I remember hearing Lenny White practice because <laughs> he lived on the same street as my yes. aunt and uncle. So uh, it was amazing because I would say, who's playing drums? <laughs> and somebody says, his name is Lenny. And he plays... Uh, He wasn't playing for Return to Forever at this moment. Mm -hmm. But um, later on, you know, we discovered him with Return to Forever. <laughs> I have a great story about Return to Forever. Let's hear it. Because when I was about 14 years old, I was playing in a band, mm -hmm. a local band. Yes. Like a cover band, you know. Ah. And we were the only kind of rock band in, in our neighborhood. See, my neighborhood being primarily black neighborhood, the music was primarily R&B music mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and jazz music, yes. funk and soul music. Yeah, of course. You know? yes. So I, even though I played with a few bands that did that, I was in this one band. Mm -hmm. The band was called Charisma. We were the only black rock band in the mm -hmm. neighborhood. And our guitar player was like Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> he, he used to dress like Jimi. <laughs> okay. He could sing like Jimmy, but he could also sing like Al Green wow. or the guy, the lead singer for the Spinners. He was a, yes. His voice was really amazing. Wow. His name was Vic Vaughn, mm -hmm. really talented guitarist. And there was an organ player in the band called Roddy de Jesus. Great organ player. It was a quartet. Mm -hmm. 
and the bass player, um, Lester Wilson, and myself. It was just four guys. Mm -hmm. And um, Lester, our bass player, was into Scientology. Oh. So he used to go to the Scientology meetings in mm -hmm. New York City. And at the meeting, he met Stanley Clark uh -huh. and Chick Corea. Yeah. That's too odd. And he says to them, I'm in a band, and we play in Central Park every Saturday. Mm -hmm. So they told Lester, okay, well, we're going to come see you next, next Saturday. Oh. Or Sunday. It was every Sunday. <laughs> this was the summer of 1973. <laughs> so the next week, Chick Corea and Stanley Clark come to see our band. <laughs> now, the guys in the band don't know who they are. <laughs> okay. But because I grew up in a jazz house, mm -hmm. I was like, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you guys know who that is? <laughs> That's Stanley Clark and Chick Corea. They're that's Return of Forever. Oh, my God. So, they say to us, uh -huh. we love your band. No, come on. <laughs> we love this band. Can we bring our band next week and play with you guys? You're kidding me. And they, <laughs> the guys go, sure, you can come. Next week, they bring Return to Forever to Central Park. <laughs> and it's Lenny White. It's the new Return to Forever. Mm -hmm. Because the first Return to Forever yes. was Aerto. Mm-hmm. On, right, on drums, yeah, yeah, exactly. his wife, Flora Purim, mm -hmm. and uh, Joe Farrell on saxophone, yeah, also, Chick and yeah. Stanley. So that was the first Return to Forever. Mm -hmm. They show up with the new Return to Forever <laughs> with Billy Connors on guitar, My God. Lenny White, Stanley, mm -hmm. and Chick. Wow. And I was like, this is unbelievable. <laughs> I was 14 years old, maybe, just about to turn. No, I was 14. And um, they played all of the music from the first electric album. Mm -hmm. uh, the album was called Hymn of the Seventh Galaxy. Yeah. They were playing this music. Wow. And I was like, this is unbelievable. And then Seven they Galaxy. took us on the road with them. We were the opening act for Return to Forever. Okay. That's stunning. <laughs> it was unbelievable. It's like, I couldn't believe, but this is the nature of this, this neighborhood in uh -huh. New York City. And there was wow. music Amazing. The, everywhere. You could easily walk down the street mm -hmm. and see these guys. Mm -hmm. There was a store in New York City called the Professional Drum Shop. Mm -hmm. It was owned by a guy named Frank Ippolito. Ippolito. Mm -hmm. And I used to go there after school just to dream because I would walk into this place and there were drums everywhere and the posters and... Uh, but you could walk in and any famous drummer would be there. Narada Michael Walden, Billy Cobham. Oh. So uh. one day I go and uh, Elvin Jones is there. He walks in and I'm like, this is unbelievable. <laughs> Elvin Jones walks in with his wife, who was a Japanese woman. Mm -hmm. And I was there to buy some drumsticks. Mm -hmm. So I'm rolling my drumsticks and then they walk in. And Frank says hello, introduces me to Elvin. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I'm <laughs> smiling. So his wife says, you go talk to Elvin. I will pick your drumsticks for you. Uh-huh. And I, I was in high school. <laughs> and uh, so they take me, Frank Ippolito, Elvin, and me, they take me to some room, and they hand me a Heineken beer. And <laughs> I'm, I don't drink, so I'm just holding the beer and staring at Elvin. <laughs> and listening to them talk. Uh -huh. And he was very nice to me. Again, I had seen him play mm -hmm. with my father a lot because yes. there, was, there were clubs in Queens, New York where these guys would play. Mm -hmm. So I remember seeing them as a kid, but it was, you know, as I'm getting older now, I'm becoming uh -huh. more aware of, right. you know, yeah. who these guys really are. <laughs> Billy Cobham and Lenny, Elvin Jones, Tony Williams. Yes. Not everyday persons. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's a remarkable environment. I remember mm -hmm. seeing the Mahavishnu Orchestra mm -hmm. live and feeling that power of yes. that band yeah. in person was uh, amazing. So, looking back from the point where you are now, mm. is there, would you agree that there was no other way for you? 
like living with all these legends in the direct neighborhood. And I, I think, did you also take lessons from these guys? Well, there was one drummer uh, that was the most influential for me as a teacher. His mm -hmm. name was Clyde Lucas. Ah. And Clyde Lucas he was... He also played with, with the Buddy Rich big band? With the Count Basie with, big oh, band. Oh, I'm sorry, Count Basie. Yeah, fantastic drummer. So, mm -hmm. y you're right, though. I mean, the path was there for me. Mm -hmm whether I realized it or not. You can't, I mean, it's just a retrospective thing. <laughs> it's, it's clear to me now, looking yes, back, exactly. my yes. age now. Yeah. But then it wasn't clear to mm -hmm. me, you know? Mm. We were talking about this yesterday with Rachel even, you know, because uh, it's, we were just talking about how when you're in the moment of doing things, it's hard to get a high view, an aerial view of it, right. because you're in it. Yes. You know, so oftentimes, uh, most of the people that have made history in the world didn't know they were making history. They were just doing what they do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think that's the essence of all of these things. I, it has to be, because, yeah. you know, you're doing it because you're inspired to do it, because mm -hmm. you love to do certain things, or you have a natural gift yes. for doing things. You're not you doing know. it in order to become famous. No, I mean, <laughs> in many ways, you're doing it because... Uh, You've, you feel some attraction to it. Mm -hmm. You know, like just last week, you know, the, the uh, head of Apple passed away, Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. So I've been looking on the internet yes. at all these interviews that he did, mm -hmm. and I ran into an old interview from 1984. He would have been, you know, in his mid to late 20s. Yes. And in the interview, he was talking about walking around with a device, a slate, he called it, that would talk to you and interact with you yes. and, mm -hmm. and it would become a part of your life. And uh, I was like, wow, that's interesting that he talked about this. So early. So early. Yes. And he mm -hmm. created it. So mm -hmm. you don't, you know, it's a, it's a perfect example. It's mm -hmm. like you just have these things inside of yourself, you know? And you just want to get them out. And you just <laughs> want to get them out. And for me, music was that way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And Interestingly enough, it wasn't necessarily from the standpoint of drumming for me always, mm -hmm. you know, because growing up the way I grew up and experiencing making music the way I did, you know, with my aunt as a pianist. I also studied violin mm -hmm. when I was in elementary school. So as a result, I got interested in the guitar. Mm -hmm. You know, I was around musicians who were l not just learning one instrument, you know, they would, you know, you had your primary instrument, but then you were always playing other instruments, like Marcus Miller, for instance, plays piano, he plays clarinet, he oh. play, you know. It's good for understanding everything. It's good for understanding. So I think as I was growing up, you know, I was, I was playing drums and it was my focus, but it wasn't the only thing I wanted mm -hmm. to do. So it was almost like when I started to get recognition as a drummer, I still didn't understand it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you're also a very good uh, songwriter. It's not that you're only a drummer. Right. I was really interested in composition and, mm -hmm. and writing and, you know. So it, it took me a while to get to the point where I understood what happened. Like, wow, <laughs> you know, what happened? Where was that point? Maybe recently. Maybe. Oh, okay. <laughs> not a long time ago. Okay. I thought perhaps when, when Sting called or some. <laughs> well, when, you know, it's funny, even a little bit before that, uh, when I got the gig with Weather Report, mm -hmm. let's just use that time period. Okay, yeah. Right, right before I got the gig with Weather Report, I got uh, a budget to record ah. from Warner Brothers Records. I see. I had a manager, uh, this woman, her name was Christine Martin, and I want to say that she was managing Steve Gadd, Mm -hmm. And she was managing Mike Manieri at the time as oh, well. I mm -hmm. And I was playing drums with Mike Manieri, but then she heard songs that I had written and things that I was singing. So she got me a, uh, a preliminary contract with Warner Brothers. So at this point in my life, I'm moving a little bit away from the drums. I'm starting to sing more, play more guitar, play more keyboards. I was writing for different artists. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and then I get this deal offer from, Weather, from Warner Brothers yeah. to become a recording artist. At the same time, I got a call from Weather Report. <laughs> and 
And I was like very confused. Because <laughs> I'm like, well, this is an uh, unusual opportunity because I was a fan of Weather Report. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, well, maybe I should take this Weather Report gig because it's really, it's an unusual call to get. It is. <laughs> and I love this band. I'm a fan yeah. of the band. So then at that moment, I said, okay, I'm going to stop the recording artist thing for a moment, and I'm going to join this band, mm -hmm. and let's just see what happens. Yes. And I think it was good. It was the right decision. <laughs> yes, I think so, too. <laughs> now, right after I joined Weather Report, uh, a friend of mine who was a very famous producer named Niall Rogers mm -hmm. called me because he was doing an album for David Bowie. And he says, Omar, for some reason, uh, Tony Thompson wasn't available for the whole album because Tony Thompson was his drummer. Yes. the drummer for the band Chic. Mm -hmm. But maybe Tony Thompson was on tour with Power Station, yeah. you know. So Niall called me and said, listen, can you do these sessions with David Bowie? And I was like, yeah, I'm free. The Weather uh -huh. Report has some time off. I'm coming back to New York. So I go back to New York and I do the sessions for Let's Dance. Mm -hmm. And all those songs, Modern Love, China Girl, wow. really a big record for yes. David Bowie mm -hmm. and ends up being a big record for my career, yes, because at this point I'm playing jazz with Weather Report, but then this album comes out mm -hmm. with this drum sound on it, and everybody goes, "What is what that?" Is that? <laughs> you know, and then it didn't make sense to them that it, that it was the same guy mm -hmm. from Weather Report. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. so in many ways, you know, you can't plan that. No. You know what I mean? Like, no, you, can't. you can't plan that. <laughs> no. You know, it's like it was perfect mm -hmm. for my personality, for what I was trying to accomplish in my career. Because one of the things that I was very clear on as mm -hmm. a drummer, as a professional, was I didn't want to be put in a box. Right. You also have that on your, on your homepage. Yes. It seems to be a big topic in your life. It was. It was a huge topic for mm -hmm. me because I didn't want to be caught just in the jazz world. Yes. And I made a very conscious effort. Mm -hmm. Every time somebody opened the box, I jump over the box, <laughs> not in the box. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> and keep moving. Yeah, I see. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not to get caught. Not to get caught. <laughs> I don't want to get caught. You know? I want to keep it interesting. Yes. And I think this attitude mm -hmm. has made my career very interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's also helped me to grow a lot. You know what I mean? Because yeah. One moment I'm playing rock, another moment I'm playing jazz, another moment I'm playing R&B music, another moment I'm playing reggae, mm -hmm. I'm playing dance music, you know. So my idea was to just have a complete and very rich musical experience. Yes. That yes. was my hope. And you surely got that. <laughs> you know? And with, uh, with the David Bowie project, he asked me to go on tour with him. Mm -hmm. Now, we're about to start... Uh, maybe the, the third tour with Weather Report, maybe even the second tour, I don't remember, but David says, listen, you know, going on tour, you can join the band. It was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I asked myself some questions. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, so I can leave Weather Report right now and join David Bowie's band. But then I said to myself, who were the drummers for David Bowie? So I sat down and I was like, uh, I couldn't think of anybody. <laughs> but I, then I thought of one drummer, Dennis Davis. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then I asked myself, who are the drummers for Weather Report? And I could name many yes. drummers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said, I better stay with this band. It helps you more. I should stay yes. with this band. Mm -hmm. It's not the money, because oh. I'm going to make more money with David Boy, but when I'm finished with David Bowie, what comes next? nobody's going to know anything about yes. me. I'm just another guy on stage playing mm -hmm. drums. No, that's but if I stay with Weather Report, the possibility is to build, a, build something real. Yes, build a name. Build a name mm -hmm. and, peop and play music that people see me. Mm -hmm. They see who right. I really am as yes. a musician. Mm -hmm. So this decision was an interesting one because 
even though I got a chance to show people that I could play rock, mm -hmm. and it's not a jazz drummer trying to play rock, <laughs> it's a rock drummer. Yes, <laughs> complete rock. Complete rock. <laughs> not, oh, he sounds like a jazz drummer. Oh, the fill-in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then I stayed with Where the Report, and I was able to use mm -hmm. my knowledge as a drummer mm -hmm. from growing up in this neighborhood of jazz tradition and right. funk and mm -hmm. R&B and everything. It was, like, it was like almost at that moment, I was the right drummer for Weather Report mm -hmm. because Weather Report needed a drummer that understood the tradition of jazz, but that could play electronic music with high energy yes. with the information from jazz. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had. I, and I was probably the youngest drummer in the band. You know, so it was an interesting point in my life mm -hmm. that, um, you know, these, these things would happen sort of at the same time. Wow. And then the very next year is when I met Sting. Mm -hmm. It was because I was with Weather Report from 82, 83, and 84. At the end of 1984, I met uh, Sting at a session for the band Dire Straits. I got called to play on Brothers in Arms mm -hmm. by Dire Straits. Yeah. And um, again, another situation you can't plan, their drummer got sick, mm -hmm. and the engineer who was recording the album was my friend. Ah. So when the drummer for Dire Straits got sick, the engineer said to Mark Knopfler, I know someone. I know the right guy. <laughs> and yeah. he calls me at home in New York. Yeah. Omar. I'm in Montserrat, and I'm looking at my clock, and it's four in the morning. <laughs> and I'm like, who is this? <laughs> Omar, it's Neil. It's Neil Dorfman, mm -hmm. is the engineer. Can you come to Montserrat tomorrow? I was like, Neil, it's four in the morning. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? <laughs> he said, I'm here doing a record with Dire Straits. Mm -hmm. And I knew the name, but I wasn't completely familiar with the music. So I said, well, cool. I'll call you back when I wake up. Let's figure it out. I'll come. I'd like to, to come there. And when I get there, I meet Mark Knopfler, and mm -hmm. the bass player, and uh, Neil. And we recorded for about two weeks mm -hmm. in Montserrat. And during this time, Sting comes with his wife, Trudy, for a holiday. And while he's there, he records on this song that was a big hit for Dire Straits mm -hmm. called Money for Nothing. Yes. And his voice is on the end of the, the record. Ah. You remember? I don't know. It's yeah, an old, very it's, old record. No, I, I know the record. Yes. Yeah. So that's how I got connected with Sting. Uh -huh. Again, you, you know. You can't plan that. You <laughs> can't plan these things. It's really an, a crazy oh kind of path. Yeah. And so after the session, we're sitting at dinner, and um, Sting starts to tell Mark about his new band. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm listening. I'm mm -hmm. at the other end of the table. And he says, yeah, I'm going to leave the police, you know, it's time mm. to make a change in my career. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of touring with that band. I want to do something different. So I'm in New York now. I've been auditioning different guys, talking to different musicians. I've been in touch with Branford Marcellus. I've been in touch with this one, that one. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening. I'm going, wow, this is really interesting. So I yell down the table, you found a drummer. <laughs> you found your, no, I said, you found your drummer. <laughs> and so Sting goes, who is that? And Mark Knopfler says to Sting, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce you. Sting, this is Omar Hakim, Omar Sting. And Sting turns around, he goes, you're Omar Hakim? And I go, yeah. He says, my manager is looking for you in New York right now. No. Okay. <laughs> because I guess, you know, inside of that, time period, mm -hmm. if you came to New York to do a record date, there were certain guys that you would look for. Yes. So we had a talk, we had a funny talk about, you know, uh, well, I think something crazy happened. Like I started, uh, I grabbed the knife and the fork and we <laughs> I played something on the, you know, just making a joke. <laughs> yes. That was the audition because he was saying he was auditioning musicians. <laughs> so something silly like that happened. But then he said, well, listen, when you get back to, I'm going to call my manager, tell him that you're here and that we met. And then when you, and, and when you come back, let's get together. Mm -hmm. So when I finished the Dire Straits album, 
go back to New York and I contact Sting mm. and we make a meeting. Yes. The day I arrive at the studio is Branford, Kenny Kirkland, and Daryl Jones. That ends up being the band. <laughs> and it was like a magical connection. Yes. It you know, sounded like a magical connection. It was a magical <laughs> connection. So it was immediate. I think we knew. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, you're talking about, you know, about the path being laid out. You know? <laughs> you know, it's really, what, what, what is really happening is that you're, follow, you're following your heart and then you're uncovering your path mm -hmm. while you're following your heart. Yeah. And sometimes you don't know what's happening, mm. but you, you proceed with faith mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and proceed with uh, focus. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, a, that was another interesting turning point. Mm. But my career is full of many of these kind of turning points, even before Sting. So you your know? decision to stay with Weather Report and not go with the David Bowie band? I think that was good at, the, yes. at that moment. Yes, exactly, because Sting now rec recognized you. Oh, is that the guy from... From Weather oh, Report? I see. Yeah, he said, I, mm -hmm. you know, you were with Weather Report, and he knew even the David Bowie record. He mm -hmm. knew that, you know? Mm -hmm. ah. So I think the David Bowie record kind of opened up my work in the rock world. Mm -hmm. You know? When I when I listen to your I listen to, to some solos recently and, and uh, also to some songs you played with and also with the Buddy Rich big band mm. and then um, I always thought I'm not trying to get you in the box now okay um, <laughs> but I always thought I can hear the rock drummer mm. Mm. it's not only the drummer though you have that background yeah so it's always like he's playing with so much power mm. with so much energy mm. it's not like um, the normal dress drummer like dee 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 right, dee right. dee dee and you're like dee 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 bounce to yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Passion, yes, passion passion exactly I'm always looking for the the passion mm -hmm. in the music mm -hmm. I'm always looking for the feeling you know for me you know drumming is not about technique it's about communication mm -hmm. it is you know what I mean yeah so When I sit down to play, my thought, my hope, mm -hmm. is that I can connect my musical thought and idea with my heart and then connect that to my body so that I can convey yeah. musical emotion. Because uh -huh. yes, I, you know? I always say drums is, is motion mm -hmm. and emotion. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's, and it's not about the kind of music. It's not. Yeah. So if you, if you can sit down at any instrument mm. and be yourself, you know, let yourself come through yeah. the instrument, you know, that the connection, the heart connection would be directly to, to, the, to the expression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then, then at that point, you have an opportunity to express beyond sort of what the mind would even want to try to judge. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, I like, it's like if you're lucky, you can move the mind out of the way mm -hmm. so that people aren't even listening from the perspective of judging it. Is it good? Is it yes, bad? Yes. It's a technique, okay. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. No, 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 no. I don't good. want your mind. Mm -hmm. I want your heart. I see. So let's right. move your mind out of the way now. Let me talk to your heart. Yeah, that's very good. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so that's always kind of how I've approached mm -hmm. playing drums and approached being a musician is that I'm looking for the passion. I'm looking for, you know, maybe that's why I love things to f groove, mm -hmm. even though they might be very difficult to play, but they don't have to sound difficult. Yes. It's you know just what I about mean? the effect it has. I'm just going after that right effect. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. Even, even listening to Weather Report records that I've played on, they could be technically demanding because the, the music of Weather Report was very technically demanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was the one gig that I've done in my life, or one of the few, where 
I had to use everything that I understood about drums. Mm -hmm. That gig required everything that I knew and yeah. understood about drumming. But not because it was about technique? No. Just because the thing you wanted to have at the end was demanding. Was demanding. So that's where the technique is important. Mm -hmm. The technique is a tool yeah. to help you express yourself right. clearly, freely and easily. It's like a toolbox. It's like a toolbox. Yeah. It's like learning a language. You know, when we're, we're talking now, but we're not thinking about the rules of language. We're not even right. thinking about ABC, the ABCs. Yeah. <laughs> where, you yeah. know, we learn these things, but mm -hmm. now we're talking, we're expressing. Yeah. Yeah. We're making jokes, we're, mm -hmm. you know, expressing from the heart. Mm -hmm. And music is the same to me. You know what I mean? It is. So, uh, and at that point, any gig that I do, whether it's a jazz gig, whether it's Sting, Madonna, mm -hmm. where I'm just playing dance grooves all night. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's another discipline of drumming. Mm -hmm. But you also enjoy that as well. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it because it's not just the playing. It's like the joy of seeing people respond to music. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's a huge show. And it's a huge show. Yeah. It's a big responsibility for the drummer. Yes. But when, when it's played right, it's very exciting. Yes. Because you see a, a whole stage full of people get fired up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And my attitude towards playing a show like that, whether it's a rock show, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, the music isn't as demanding, so you're not exploring in the same way, yes. improvisational music. Yes. It's a set show. Mm -hmm. But my attitude is every show is the first show of the tour. Ah. Every show is the first night. Uh -huh. Very exciting and very spontaneous. Every show is the first night, yeah. which wow. means that, you know, okay, yeah, we've played this show 50 times, mm -hmm. but this audience, this is their first time. Yes, true. So my commitment to being a musician and being a drummer and mm -hmm. being here in this band, on this stage, is to play tonight like it's the first night for the audience. Mm. And wow. with that in mind, I would come on stage and just try to bring that joy, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and you can see that when you play. I, <laughs> wanted, and, and Madonna, I want to say that when I was with Madonna and the dancers, I mean, I remember the smiles. They would walk by the drum set <laughs> and I would be kicking their ass <laughs> and they would just be smiling at the drums, you know, because it made them want to dance. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I remember their faces, and mm -hmm. I remember Madonna looking at me like, yeah! <laughs> you know, That's because good. we yes. would kick ass every wow. night on mm -hmm. that tour. That's it was a great feeling, man. Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun, and the band was awesome. We mm -hmm. even had Victor Bailey on bass. Mm. Can you imagine that? The Weather Report <laughs> no, rhythm I section. because I never played with someone <laughs> that good. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, one day we were, we were somewhere, and... Uh, some kids bought Weather Report albums to sign to a Madonna gig, and Madonna goes, what are those <laughs> records? <laughs> Come on! <laughs> what is that? You know, and we said, well, you, you hired the Weather Report rhythm section yes. to play in your band, you know? <laughs> wow. Awesome. <laughs> very oh, <man>. funny. <laughs> That's very good. Victor Bailey and I, we had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> so, um, let's talk about your current project mm. with the trio of us. Yeah. So that's a different, different thing. Yeah. Um, just to mention one more thing with the box. Okay. Um, I saw some uh, announcements of the concerts. Yes. And there was, na 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 na, na is playing, na na, and the fusion drummer, Omar. <laughs> <laughs> they're still trying. Yes, they're still trying. <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> it's okay. It's That's good, cool. man. Perhaps Whatever. We need it just yeah. to, to know which, uh, which way. Yeah. I don't know. I, maybe it's just the nature of the mind, you mm. know, it needs to categorize yes, exactly. something. That's okay. To get along with it. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> So, um, could you tell us something, what is the music about in Trio of Oz? Well, the Trio of Oz um, is, is, a, is, a, is an interesting opportunity for me to revisit my jazz roots. Mm -hmm. It is a jazz trio, yes. piano, bass, and drums. And drums yes. We are playing what very much sounds like jazz, mm -hmm. until you look at the, the, the songs. Mm -hmm. the compositions. Basically, we've taken alternative rock songs by Coldplay, The Police, The Killers, 
Depeche Mode, and we've turned them into jazz arrangements. <laughs> we've got a song by uh, Death Cab for Cutie. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting repertoire of music. Yes. And this isn't a new idea. <laughs> jazz musicians have always taken the pop music of the moment mm -hmm. and reinterpreted it. Yes. It's not new. I mean, some guys would like to say, you know, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're taking alternative rock songs. Well, alternative rock and pop songs right now, it's just the music of this time period. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even John Coltrane in the 1960s took a pop classic, My Favorite Things, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. made it a jazz exploration. Reassemble it, yes. Re uh, di yeah, disassemble it yes. <laughs> and reassemble it in yes. a new way. Uh -huh. And basically that's what we've done with mm -hmm. Rio of Oz. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good for me because I, there's not a lot of recordings out there of me playing bebop, ah. of playing in this way. So yes. the Trio of Oz CD is uh, it's something that I'm, I'm happy, very happy with and proud of because it's a, I think it's a pretty good representation of that side of my drumming. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, I think when you listen to it, there's, you still hear me coming through mm -hmm. and the, um, the connection of then mm -hmm. and now. Yes. You know what I mean? It's the same with the Reflections project. Yeah, the Reflections project was a project. Well, what I wanted to do with that was take all of my instrumental compositions that I was most happy with mm. and just put them on one CD oh. um, with, with some new music. Yes, exactly. Um, which is more of the fusion funk side of my playing, mm -hmm. you know? But I always thought, it's, it's, I, I can always hear the Omar Hakim mm. in that. It's, mm. it's always in the drumming. I, I wouldn't say it's in some kind of licks or something like it. It's just, I always have a feeling of raw power and energy in that. Mm -hmm. It's always like, even in the more uh, calm songs, which are not that, um, that, that rocky. Or yeah, something or flashy. Like yes, or flashy. It's always like I'm, I'm, I always have a glimpse of that. It's like, ah, I wanted to hear that. I'm, ah, yeah, I'm enjoying yeah. it. Yeah. It's really always enjoying. No, it's true, man. And, and I think the, the drums as a musical instrument, you know, there's a lot to explore there, mm -hmm. sonically, tonally, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so, you know, there's this part of my playing that, you know, I like to explore the power and the, the groove and and all of that. But at the same time, there's another part of the playing that I like to explore texture mm -hmm. and, and elegance and yes. uh, thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so on a good day, if I'm lucky, I'm putting these, all of these <laughs> elements together. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's successful. But that's mm. the joy, mm. is, the, uh, is, the, is the attempt every time you sit down. Mm. You know, and you won't know what happens. And you don't know what happens. <laughs> and, th and that's music. That's, mm -hmm. that's real. Because it's, it's not just what you're playing, it's what you're living. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? That's true, yeah. You play, like you, you play exactly like you are. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, so with the trio of Oz, I think what's been happening, especially over the last couple of months we've been touring, mm -hmm. we've really been exploring mm -hmm. these compositions like to the point where we almost throw an arrangement out the window on stage <laughs> and you know and it's very dangerous but also funny it's fun man <laughs> because and i think what's important about that is that people know mm -hmm. they can feel when it's real mm -hmm. they can yeah. feel when you're not playing something that you practiced right they can tell Yeah. They c can feel that they're on a ride. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, they're even a little uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, is, are, is he going to make it? Is, <laughs> is she going to make that? <laughs> Whoa! And then when you make it, it's like, woo! You yes. know what I mean? Because, you know, <laughs> exactly. it's that, that, yeah. like, that feeling. You know, uh -huh. it's like, wow. So I like this. Uh -huh. Let's explore mm -hmm. this moment together. You know, yeah. everybody, the audience and us mm -hmm. together, you know? Do you have any certain plans for the future or is uh, just like always spontaneously and... 
Yeah, well, We're awaiting the next call. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a, there's some of that involved, but then mm -hmm. I'm I lately because of the Reflections project mm -hmm. and the band, my band that was on tour last year, yes, and then also with the trio of Oz, it seems like I'm more playing the band leader role now, mm -hmm. you know, and I think I'm kind of more ready for it, you know. In the past, you know, I was always doing more sideman work because I was just busy. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a curse, you know, because you're so busy as a sideman, you don't get to focus on, yeah. and you, on don't get a rest. you know, so. being a, a, a band leader. Mm -hmm. And I think now, you know, it's like after a long career, you know, at 52 years old, I'm finally interested in really <laughs> being a band leader, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. But uh, that, so that's sort of where I am mm -hmm. now, you know, I'm um, planning to go home um, and Myself, my wife Rachel, the mm -hmm. pianist Rachel Z, and um, Solomon Dorsey. We're going to start a new Trio of Oz album. Mm. And then I'm also going to finish up some more uh, writing for my own song project. And uh, what else am I doing? Another interesting project, I'm, I've been working with a guy named Jerry Douglas, mm -hmm. who is a fantastic. Uh, slide guitarist and dobro mm -hmm. player. Mm -hmm. He's one of the, the geniuses of, mm -hmm. of country music and bluegrass music. Yeah. And uh, his manager is an old friend of mine. Oh. And as a result, I've been pulled into another world that I wasn't expecting, different, yes. which is bluegrass and country music. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I ran into some old friends while I was there, like mm. Bela Fleck, ah. who, who Bela Fleck and I went to high school together. <laughs> Uh, so it was interesting to, to see Bela. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just interesting to get pulled into another world. Mm -hmm. So we're going to record an album with that band. It's the Jerry Douglas Trio featuring Victor mm -hmm. Krauss on bass oh, and okay. myself. Mm -hmm. And we're doing this weird combination of bluegrass, funky rock, <laughs> you know? Well, that sounds amazing, too. Yeah, so look out for that. That's probably going to come out sometime next year. Okay. Along with another album by the Trio of Oz mm. and then another Omar record. And I'm kind of more f just focusing on those things. Then I think the other project is uh, we're going to do a tour of Europe next spring with an Italian pop singer named Pino Danielli. Okay, I haven't heard that. You know, okay, so we've been working with, mm -hmm. with him okay. in Italy. Mm -hmm. So that's, we're going to do a few concerts with him, too. So it's, bu it's, a, it's, busy, it's, busy. it's a busy time, man. <laughs> Better than boring. <laughs> Better than, it's not boring. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm astonished. Okay. <laughs> Omar, I want to thank you that you gave us this interview. Okay, it's, my pleasure. I got some amazing insights now <laughs> okay. of your life. And it's, I hope you get to do that till you turn 100 and and more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to the next project. Thank you very much. For Thank, you, Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.